Welcome to the Wild Pigs History, Ecology, and Management in South Carolina webinar. My name is Corey Heaton and I'm the Extension Wildlife Specialist with Clemson University. And today we're going to go through a whole lot of information as it pertains to wild pigs in South Carolina and the United States. We've been doing these hog programs across the state since 2007. Uh, so this is nothing new for us. And we've traveled around uh, pre-COVID and uh, did a lot of classes, hands-on classes with teaching farmers and landowners, how to set up traps and how to be more effective with trapping. And uh, it's been a very successful program for us as far as getting people informed uh, about the proper ways to do things. Uh, and it's my favorite way of doing it, hands-on of course, but under the current situation, uh, tonight's webinar is about the best option that we have. Uh, but we have been doing these for a long time and we've learned a lot along the way and some things have changed along the way and we'll kind of present that to you as we move through this. Hogs have a pretty long history in the United States. Uh, we do know that the first pigs arrived here in 1539, courtesy of Hernando de Soto. But uh, during the Spanish uh, travels throughout the, uh, the Americas, we saw pigs getting released uh, basically everywhere they stopped. And it is possible that they showed up in uh, the US a little earlier than this. Um, and if you take a a moment to read uh, Dr. Mayer and Dr. Brisbane's book, Wild Pigs in the United States. They've done an excellent job of, of comprising all the history of wild pigs and how they've moved throughout this country. Uh, and it does a really good job of laying it out where those pigs originally started here. Um, and as we move into today, you know, the current population is estimated somewhere around 7 million in the United States. Um, and this has changed a little bit over the past 20 years. Uh, when I first started teaching these classes, we had hogs in 39 states and four Canadian provinces. Today, uh, we're depending on which source you look at, we're somewhere between 30 and 35 states with feral hog populations. Uh, a few states have been successful in eradicating them. Um, those states were particularly effective because they caught the situation early and managed to stop it before it got it out of hand. Um, if you go to states like Texas, though, we're looking at 5 million hogs in Texas. And if you take in the, the whole area of Texas with that kind of population, we're looking at somewhere around 19 pigs per square mile. Uh, if you look at Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina, we're somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 million hogs for those three states. And, and just to put it in perspective, at Texas, we're at 19 pigs per square mile. In South Carolina, that would come out, taking the total area of the state into consideration, we'd be somewhere around three to four pigs per square mile. Uh, so much less of a problem here than in Texas, but still a very big problem. A little more on the history. Um, so some things that we do know. Uh, we do know that the first European settlers, the first permanent European settlers, purchased feral hog meat from the Native Americans. So by the mid 1600s, wild pigs were already well enough established in South Carolina that they were not only being hunted, uh, they were being sold, traded, bartered, whatever, uh, as a food source. So they've been here a long time. Uh, and going through the history, most likely the first introduction in South Carolina probably happened in 1526 uh, at the mouth of Winyaw Bay. We had a small Spanish settlement that started there um, and more than likely they brought pigs with them. The settlement of course didn't make it at the time, uh, but that doesn't mean they packed the hogs up and left with them. They were probably turned loose. The first actual documented hogs in South Carolina was in 1566 in Beaufort County, uh, at St. St. Elena settlement. Um, but there had also been a settlement on Paris Island a few years prior to that by the French. So there's a possibility that, you know, slightly earlier than that, they could have been pigs brought into the state. Suscrofa is the animal that we're talking about. This is the wild boar, but it's also the source of domestic swine. Uh, originally native to Europe, Asia, and Northern Africa, um, but today you will find them spread, I believe, throughout every continent except Antarctica. So they have been moved all over the globe. Uh, they're everywhere. Uh, one of the things, though, that we can point out here, the wild boar does not very closely resemble uh, the domestic swine that we're all used to. Uh, if you're looking at wild boar, you'll notice that they're higher at the front shoulders than they are at the hips. 
So that gives them that kind of upright appearance. Um, typically they have a longer, more sloping snout than what you would see on domestic swine. Uh, you would notice the guard hairs to appear a lot different than they do or a lot thicker than they are on domestic swine. Um, they appear taller than domestic swine. And over the years, a lot of folks hunting, I, I hear a lot how big a hog was when they come running by. Um, they're not as big as you think they are. They just look big because they're taller. Um, they're more compact. They weigh less typically. Um, but they are the same animal that domestic swine started from. Another interesting fact there, there are quite a few different species in the Sush genus. Um, and a lot of those are bearded pigs and warty pigs that are kind of scattered all over the globe. But in a lot of those places, we've lost some of those species. They, they have either gone uh, locally extinct or entirely extinct. And one of the main reasons for that, besides habitat loss, another main reason for that is the introduction of Suscrofa. So when we brought wild boar or domestic pigs in, they actually outcompeted the native ones uh, and they're no longer around. Uh, so that's something as, as biologists today and land managers today, we really need to take into consideration. We know for a fact they've had some pretty significant impacts on wildlife. I don't know that it's fully qualified or quantified yet, but there is definitely a serious threat there to native species. A little more on the history. So the Russian boar, I hear that all the time, is actually the Eurasian boar, uh, native to the Ural Mountains of Russia, Poland, Germany. Um, they arrived in the U.S. in 1890. Uh, a wealthy landowner imported some from Germany, released them into a 20,000 acre enclosure. Surprise, surprise, they got out, which has been the case time and time again. Um, but in this situation, they were put into a split rail fence. So I don't know what they were expecting, but obviously they didn't stay long. Now, the downside to this is after this introduction, more and more and more introductions have taken place over the history. Um, and, and at this point, there's no telling how many introductions there's been. Uh, but people on a lot of these hunting properties really valued that Eurasian look, um, the gaminess of the Eurasian hog. So they were introduced in a lot of places to improve the stock that was already out there. Uh, whether or not it improved it or not, I don't know. But in South Carolina, it's very apparent that it happened. Um, so that's a big thing. They have been moved all over the country. So in some places you may still find some pretty close to pure genetics uh, for Eurasian boars. And along those lines with those expansions, what's really happened with our population in the U.S. over the years? So looking at these figures from USDA, in 1988 we had hogs in 462 U.S. counties. Uh, in 2004, we had them in 1,042 counties, uh, which, you know, and I believe there's a little over 3,000 counties in the United States. Um, taking that into consideration, in the early to mid 80s, about 15% of U.S. counties actually had feral pigs. By 2004, 35% of U.S. counties had feral pigs. Uh, in 2021, I don't have a good number for you on that right now. I'm sure the USDA is working on that. They've been keeping pretty good tabs on these things over the years. Uh, but I would anticipate the 2021 figures to be a lot closer, uh, maybe not completely uh, as low as what we had in the early 80s, but closer to the early 80s than what you see in this 2010 map. Uh, since that 2010 map, there have been some fairly successful eradication programs and we have been able to get populations out in a few states, Wisconsin, Illinois, Idaho, Colorado, Nebraska, Utah, New York. So, so quite a few states have had successful eradication programs. And one of the main things that has made that uh, happen was you had populations that were limited to one or two counties in a state. And within those counties, they were limited to one or two small geographical areas. And when that happens, it's pretty easy to get in there in a timely manner and take care of that before it becomes a problem. In South Carolina, we're dealing with a whole different animal. Um, we've, we've had, you know, we've had uh, pigs in this state longer than we've had uh, permanent European settlements here. Uh, so we got five or 600 years of dealing with pigs to catch up with. Uh, so, you know, the, the concept of eradication in South Carolina, though I don't want to say it's impossible, is pretty far-fetched at this point. 
So just looking at some of this stuff again, um, in 1982, the map on your, on your left, you notice all those blue areas are counties that had feral pig populations in 1982. Uh, moving over, I believe this is the 2019 figure beside her, maybe 2020, I can't tell on my computer. Uh, but you will notice a, a, a pretty significant uh, increase in the amount of area they're covering. Uh, but you'll also notice there's not a whole lot of difference in the states with pig populations from 82 to present. Uh, if we backed up a few years, I think you would see a difference um, because that was prior to some of these eradication programs. Uh, so currently today, I think we're closer to where we were at in 82 than we were in say 2010, um, but we still have a long way to go. What about the hogs here at home? Uh, so if we're looking just at South Carolina, we have a pretty interesting mixture of hogs across our state. You know, there's a lot of Eurasian blood in different spots. Uh, it is definitely prevalent throughout the state now, but we also have a lot of domestic ancestry. Uh, so originally, you know, the mountain and Piedmont hogs were really heavily Eurasian influenced. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes back from some introductions, uh, North Carolina, Tennessee areas uh, that just moved down out of the mountains and, and those pigs were, were pure Eurasians when they first moved down. Um, now what we're seeing uh, is kind of a mix statewide. You know, on the coast, when I first started messing with hogs 25 years ago, uh, you know, on the coast you had black hogs, red hogs, and spotted hogs, but that was it. You didn't, you didn't see a lot of Eurasian genetics. If you go to the coast today, you're not going to be able to really tell a, a coastal hog from a Piedmont hog or a mountain hog. They all look very similar now. Uh, but we have a lot of diversity in the genetics. You got a lot of these domestic uh, breeds. Some of the most common ones that you're going to see in that feral population are going to be Duroc, Hamps, maybe a little Berkshire here and there. Uh, then you got some of the old Spanish genetics that were brought over, you know, several centuries ago. Uh, and then you got some of that Eurasian blood that was brought in. So we, we really do have a hodgepodge. We got a little bit of everything going on which makes the animal even more difficult to get under control because you got a diverse gene pool. When you got a diverse gene pool, your chances of survival tend to go up. So what does this look like, uh, the distribution across South Carolina over time? Um, so like I said, back in the 80s, uh, we did not have them in all 46 counties. They were basically confined uh, to those mountain areas, uh, the lower Savannah Valley, uh, the water reach system and the Santee Cooper area, Santee Lakes. Uh, you had them in the PD drainage and up and down the Ace Basin, but they were pretty much confined uh, to those riverine systems. Uh, and that, that pretty much stayed the trend up until the, the mid to late 80s. In the 90s, we saw hogs kind of go wild in this state. And I think that was well, I don't think, I'm, I'm pretty positive that was entirely due to a lot of pigs getting moved around. Um, I still hear a lot about that, but I don't believe, you know, I, I'm not sure how much movement of these hogs is actually still going on today. In the 90s, it was an issue. To date, I don't hear about it as much as I used to. I'm sure there's still some people that move hogs around in this state, but we're not seeing it at the same level we did in the 90s. Um, but again, we started out with, with pigs confined to those few counties. And then by 2011, um, you know, we were all the way up to all 46 counties having feral pigs. Now these figures do a good job of representing what that population has done over time, but they can be somewhat deceiving. Uh, to me, when I look at these and I see that that county is solid red, it makes me think that pretty much anywhere I go in that county, there's a chance feral pigs are gonna be there. Uh, and, and the reality is that that's not the case. This is a very valid figure and it does a good job of pointing out uh, the trend with what has happened with pig populations, but it's not as accurate as it could be. So if we flip over to here, these are some maps that, that Charles Ruth with DNR uh, let me use that show where those populations are actually at. So if you look at it from a county level, this map's solid red, but when you look at the actual populations, um, it's not. What you see is a, is a population abundances along these river drainages. And, and that would be what we would expect where we have existing populations 
our movements back and forth and in and out of those, those, those river systems. Uh, very common what we would expect. A lot of that is natural movements, natural movements. Not always somebody called them, brought them over here and turned them loose. I think that's a, a little bit short-sighted. We're not giving those animals full credit. Yes, people absolutely move them up and down river drainages. I, I will give you that. But we have to take into consideration too, those animals are more than capable of moving back and forth up and down those river drainages on their own without assistance, all right? I have personally watched a hog move over 13 miles in a single day. I have also seen hogs with tracking collars on them go from a bedding area and two hours later be on a bait pile almost five miles away. They're very capable of moving. And, and that makes, makes perfect sense that they would move up and down those river systems. The problem and the easiest way to point out releases and introduction is when we start seeing these populations not tied. So when we get up here, there's not a population around this. Those pigs didn't just magically appear there. Somebody dumped those pigs out. All right. If you get to looking over time, you would notice by 2010, a lot more of those little individual isolated dots appear. Those are introductions. Those are introductions, no doubt in my mind. But a lot of this movement up and down the river systems are natural movements. But these isolated dots all by themselves, it's a whole different story. Those pigs had help getting there. So what is our population look like? And I get this a lot, and I've, I've talked to quite a few reporters in the past few weeks about the pig population. I keep hearing that the pig population in South Carolina is exploding. It's exploding. No, the pig population already exploded. Um, to be honest, we've been fairly stable with our population over the past 10 years. Uh, this is a, a, a figure that I got from DNR, and it shows you the mean estimated hog population for each year since 2002. Uh, and, and based on their estimates, we were just under 100,000 pigs uh, in 2002. And in 2019, we ended somewhere around 140, 135,000 pigs. So over that whole span of time, the population difference is really only 30,000, 35,000 animals. I wouldn't call that an explosion. Um, but it is possible um, that at times we do see these populations explode until something limits them and brings that population back down, which is why you see all these spikes in this figure. Uh, but the grand scheme of things, we hit 150,000 hogs in this state somewhere between 2007 and 2008. Since 2007, 2008, we've went up and down, up and down, but we kind of come back to where we're not really greatly exceeding uh, that average or mean of 150,000 pigs uh, in the state. Uh, so that's pretty good information to have. The, the population seems to be holding somewhere in there. Uh, and unless, you know, an abundance of resources becomes available, I don't expect it to get a whole lot worse uh, as long as people don't move them around. People start moving them around again, you know, or continue to move them around. This could, this could greatly change. But currently, over the past 10 years, we have not seen an explosion in the population. So what does our annual harvest look like? And DNR collects some data every year through their deer hunter surveys. All right, so if you're a deer hunter, you may have received one of these over the years, uh, but at the end of deer season, Charles will send out a uh, survey to a certain percentage of the licensed hunters and it uh, asks a lot of questions about hunting and property management and these things. One of the things on that, that survey or questionnaire is did you harvest holes? Uh, and so based on those responses, they have developed uh, these estimated hog harvest. And, and what you'd see going back to, to 2002, um, we were harvesting just over 20,000 animals when we had uh, roughly 100,000 animal population. So we were harvesting about 20% of that through deer hunting activities, all right? Rolling forward today, we're around 150,000 hogs and we're killing just over 30,000 pigs. So we're still around 20%, a little over 20%, give or take. Um, so each year our deer hunters are, are harvesting about 30,000 pigs, all right? These figures don't necessarily include trapped hogs. So a lot of people are trapping hogs that don't deer hunt. 
so they wouldn't get the questionnaire or the survey. Um, it doesn't include numbers specifically from hog doggers. So there's a lot of people that hunt hogs with dogs and they take a lot of pigs every year. Um, but these numbers don't necessarily include that. All right. So it is possible, uh, taking all that into consideration, that we may be harvesting more than 20%, or I would expect we're harvesting more than 20% of that population each year. I'm going to spend a little more time on that in the next slide or two slides from now, but that is something to consider. And if we look across South Carolina, you know, looking at those harvest trends, uh, the counties marked in red uh, represent the top 50% of harvest. The counties in yellow are the lower 50% of harvest. This pretty much reflects what you would expect to see based on population densities. Where those population densities are high, we're going to have a higher harvest. Where the population densities are lower, we're going to have a lower harvest. This pretty much reflects exactly what that population looks like across the state. So those red counties are areas where we have high densities of pigs. Um, I'm kind of surprised that it's not further up the Savannah Valley. Um, I would have expected it to go a little higher up with those being high density populations, but uh, for some reason that doesn't seem to be the case. So what does that look like at county by county? Um, the top 10 counties in 2019 uh, for hog harvest, Allendale was number one, uh, Hampton and Calhoun was second, third, Anderson County fourth, Abbeville was right up there, Bamberg County was pretty high, Sumter County was in the top 10, Marion, Berkeley, McCormick. All of those counties, I know from personal experience, I would have expected to be in that category because they have high density populations. Uh, on the other side of this, the bottom five counties were Lexington, Greenville, Saluda, Cherokee, and York. Um, that pretty much makes sense to me. Um, based on what I know about the, the hog population out across the state, I can understand that. And, and that's what, you know, again, just to reiterate, where we have high densities of pigs, we're going to expect the deer hunters to harvest more of those pigs. And again, these numbers are based on surveys that went out to deer hunters. So these are the counties highest for harvest for those that are taking pigs while they're deer hunting. All right, let's switch gears and talk real quick about biology and then I'm gonna to try to tie all of those previous figures into this. Um, so pigs have a pretty interesting biology. Uh, sexual maturity, you know, they're, they're typically sexually mature by six months of age. Uh, and females, we typically see the first litter at 13 months old it can happen that their first litter occurs by the time they're six months old. You know, some of them, you know, mature faster than others. Um, but typically 13 months is when she's gonna have that first litter. Gestation, 114 days. Um, I remember my grandfather teaching me pig gestation years ago, but that was three months, three weeks, and three days. I'm sure a lot of you learned it that way as well. Uh, and litter size is approximately six, but all eight of them survive. Uh, I hope somebody chuckled at that, but, the reality is I've opened up a lot of pigs over the years. I've had sows that had a single pig in them, and I've had sows that had as many as 11 pigs in them. Um, so it's all over the board, but the average in study after study after study comes out to six pigs uh, per litter. And, and most sows are going to produce one and a half litters per year. Uh, piglets are weaned by the time they're three months old. They're capable of being fully on their own. Uh, although that doesn't tend to happen, you know, even in the situations where something happens to the to the sow, those pigs are going to find another group to get with. Um, they're pretty social animals. They don't they don't spend a lot of time alone when they're young. They're in groups. Uh, breeding season. Uh, it's not like deer. It's not like turkey. It's not like any of the other animals we're used to dealing with. There's no defined breeding season for pigs. They're going to come in heat every 21 days. Whenever they come in heat, there's going to be a boar following that will find them. Um, so every 21 days, that sow is going to cycle again. Uh, and it's pretty unusual for her to go very long without, without getting bred. The only, only situations where I would expect that to be common uh, for sows to cycle without getting bred are areas uh, where we have new introductions and there are not a lot of boars in the area. Outside of that, there's going to be a boar that will find them. Uh, lifespan. There's been a lot of work done on that. There's a good study out of Texas, uh, basically shows that, you know, in the wild, these pigs are going to make it four to eight years, somewhere in that range. Um, and that's about it. Home range, I'm going to show you some more data on this in a minute, but home range is somewhere between four and six square miles. 
that that varies tremendously based on the habitat and food resources, you know, and 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 some of these studies, you know, you get down in Texas where they've had some pretty severe droughts while they were doing pig studies, and and some of those home ranges get up around 20, 20 plus square miles because food and water become so limited, they have to travel more uh, to find the resources they need. Size, you know, males are going to get to be 200 pounds, you know, female fully mature, 125 to 175. And these are estimates, you know, these pigs can get bigger than that. They can be smaller than that. It all depends on where you're at. You know, I see a lot of differences. Um, but I also hear about all these six and 800 pound hogs too. And, you know, I've been doing this a long time and about 400 is the biggest I've ever seen in the woods. Uh, that was a true wild uh, pig. Uh, that wasn't dependent on... Uh, catfish food like some of them we know about and some of the other ones um, but a 400 pound boar is pretty rare in the wild thank goodness um, that's the last thing you want to have to deal with on a regular basis um, but I always tell this story it's kind of funny and unless you've ever killed one of these big 300 400 pound hogs you probably don't get it but my first question when somebody tells me they killed a big 400 pound boar is how'd you get it out of the woods and they say me and Johnny drug it out no, you didn't. I guarantee you, you didn't drag it out. How'd you get it in the truck? Me and Johnny loaded in the truck. No, you didn't. And for those of y'all who have actually killed 400 pound hogs, you understand what I'm saying, but there's times a four wheeler can't even take care of. But a 200 pound boar hog is a very impressive animal. Uh, and it looks a lot bigger than it actually weighs. So uh, throw some of them on the scales and see where you're actually at. But a 200 pound boar is a big boar. Uh, a 200 pound sow is a giant sow, but they are out there. What do they eat? You know, I, I hear stories about this all the time. What do they eat? There's been study after study after study done on this. Uh, Dr. Mayer did a study down at the Savannah River site years ago. Based on what came out of his study, uh, you know, they were, they were eating trash. They were eating uh, carry-on or dead animals. They were eating live animals, fungi, algae, uh, and, and predominantly plants. If you group all of it together for his study, 90% of that diet was, was plants. Uh, and then over at the Borderlands Research Institute in Texas, they did another study very similar to this. And, and in that study, you're at, what, 98% um, vegetative materials. So a lot of that diet for wild pigs is plant-based. Um, do they eat other things? Absolutely. Um, they root and they eat what they find. Worms, salamanders, lizards, frogs, toads, birds, bird eggs, you know, if they can catch it, they will eat it. And, and I've always kind of tried to tell people it this way. If it has a calorie in it, a pig will eat it. And if it has a calorie in it, that pig already knows it has a calorie in it. So he's going to eat it. Um, they're very resourceful. They don't waste a lot. Um, they're they're going to make use of what is out there. Uh, and and they're, they're opportunistic omnivores you know they're capable of being predators they're they're capable of living just on uh plants um they're a highly adaptable highly uh opportunistic species and that's one of the things that makes it difficult to control them so those those home range and movements this is a, a figure that dr beasley down at savannah river site sent me today to help me point this out you know we talk about that home range being four to six square miles in most of these studies and, and I, you, you've already heard me say it, it's very closely tied to those water bodies, those river, river drainages. Um, and, and in that mindset, you tend to think of them moving up and down the river in kind of a linear fashion. But the reality is it's not a linear movement pattern. Uh, and if you look, each one of these little blobs, whoop, if I can find my cursor again, here we go. If you look at this blob, that would represent the home range of that group of pigs. That's where they're spending their time. Um, so you, you notice that it, that it is basically an amorphous shape. It, it's not uh, round, it's not linear, it's not any of that. It is built based on the geography and the resources available to them. And uh, they're gonna spend most of their time in a core area with that, within that territory or, or home range. And, and when resources become limited or they get spooked, they will move out of there uh, and, and use more of their range uh, or possibly leave that range. Um, Daily movements, highly variable. Um, if all the resources they need are close by and they're not pressured, they're not gonna spend a whole lot of effort moving around the landscape. They're gonna bed up in the thickest stuff they can find and then they're gonna move to that food resource when the sun goes down, they're gonna eat what they want and move right back to that bedding area. Um, 
when we start seeing food resources become limited uh, late winter, uh, you know, late summer, late winter, those two times are when I really see them move the most, they may move several miles every day, um, just depending on how far they have to go to obtain the resources they need to survive. Most of the time, you're going to see those movements nocturnal. Uh, they're going to be most of the places in South Carolina that have pigs have pressure on those pigs. And because of that, they don't spend a lot of time moving around the daylight. If you do see them in daylight, it's typically like diurnal movements where you're seeing them right after sunrise or just before sunset or right after sunset. Uh, so low light conditions is when they're gonna be moving the most. In situations where they don't have pressure, it is not uncommon to see movements throughout the day. Um, you know, so that nocturnal diurnal thing has, it is impacted pretty big, in my opinion, uh, by pressure that's being put on those animals. So that herd that's out there on, on your property, what is it made of? Well, your mature boars are typically solitary. So they're spending their life in nose range of those sounders. So they, they, they kind of follow those, those sounders around and use their nose to determine when those sows start to come in heat. And then you'll see them venture into that sounder. Um, when, when they get done with their business, they move on about their way and go back to that solitary lifestyle. Um, and that's just the day in the life of a boar. Let's walk around and see if we can find a sow. And if we don't, we'll just go eat something and lay down. That's how they spend their days. Sounders, on the other hand, are comprised of lots of hogs. Uh, you know, some of these groups may be as small as four or five animals. Some of them may be as large as 40 or 50 animals, maybe even more. But within that sounder, you're going to have several adult sows. You're going to have the, the pigs they're currently nursing or just weaned and the Schultz or, or juvenile sub-adult pigs uh, from the previous litter uh, or previous litters. Uh, interestingly, a lot of these are, are almost set up in a, in a maternal organization. Uh, so, so you have adult sows that are closely related females. Uh, they may be litter mates. They may be, uh, you know, uncles or aunts and nieces and those type of things, but they're typically somewhat related uh, fairly tightly uh, family groups and and they stay together uh, and the, the female pigs that, that are born into this group will most likely join this group some of them may leave to join other groups um, the male pigs that are here will stay till they start reaching sexual maturity and then they'll get run off and uh, they'll form little bachelor groups for a while till they're fully mature and then typically what we see is they go solitary as well uh, and that may be you know over a year year and a half before they reach that point um, but that herd's gonna consist of several sounders in most of these locations, and you may have quite a few pigs on any given site. So this is a, a worst case scenario of what can happen with a pig population. And I'm not telling you this is scientific and this is how it happens in the wild, no. This is just an illustration of the absolute worst case scenario to show you what can happen when pigs get introduced into the landscape. So let's just say, in January, somebody's kind enough to drop off a mature boar and a mature sow on a new piece of property with no pig population. And let's just say that by coincidence, that sow gave birth right after they were released. Well, the average litter size we discussed is six. And we're going to assume that it's half and half male and female. So that mature born sow that we dropped off, as soon as we dropped them off, she had a litter of pigs. So we, we just added six more pigs to that population. All right, worst case scenario, she manages to wean those pigs and she is bred back and she could potentially have a second litter of pigs in June. So we're gonna add six more pigs to the population. So we've gone from two to 14. Believe it or not, if all the stars align and everything works out perfect, it is possible for her to drop a third litter in November. And that would again be six pigs, half and half male and female. So we've now gone from two that showed up in January to 20 by November. But that's not the end. That first litter of pigs that was born in January is also gonna reach sexual maturity at six months of age. 
And in a worst case scenario, let's say they were all bred, all the sows got bred. So each one of those three sows that were born in litter one can have six pigs in that litter. So now we have had six litters of pigs in a single year that was derived from the original two introduced in January. The scary thing about this, we started with two pigs. At the end of year one, we've got 38 pigs. So year two begins with 19 sows that are at or near sexual maturity. So there is potential for exponential growth, uh, really fast uh, pigs populating the landscape. And I'm not gonna tell you I've seen this exact example play out, but I have seen introductions that blew up really quick. And, and one of the things we have to keep in mind, if there are not pigs there, chances are there are resources there to support pig populations because they're opportunistic omnivores. There's not a whole lot they can't eat. And if they've got food, water, shelter, and a little bit of space for themselves, they can pretty much make it in this state. Uh, there's not a whole lot to limit them there. Uh, so, so this is scary. And this is why so many of us are concerned when pigs are getting moved around and dumped out in this state, because it can blow up really fast. It's not like dealing with deer where you're gonna have one or two fawns per doe every year. This is a lot more than, than what we're expecting out of a deer. So they did a good study uh, down at Texas A&M with some models to basically use a model to show you what happens with a wild hog population based on the amount of control that is going into it. So in this particular case, they started out with 2,600,000 pigs. And if you look over to annual population harvest rate, so they had different models that they ran. They ran if they didn't harvest any pigs, if they harvested 15% of the population, if they harvested 28%, 41%, or 66%, all right? Then if you look over the next column, five-year population increase. So if we don't harvest any pigs and we started with 2.6 million, five years down the road, we're 8.6 million. If we harvested 15%, we're at 6.5 million. If we harvest 28%, we're at 5.2 million. If we harvest 41%, we're at 4.2 million. That's an increase. So you add that to the initial population. Uh, so, for example, with 0% harvest, we're up to over 10 million pigs uh, in five years. But the interesting one in this particular model, with an annual population harvest rate of 66%, we have a five-year increase of zero. That doesn't mean we have zero pigs. We still have 2.6 million pigs, but the population hasn't gotten any bigger. And if you look through the literature on, on pigs uh, control, what you're gonna see is, is somewhere between high 50s and 80% annual harvest required, required to keep the population stable. So somewhere between high 50s and 80% of that herd has to be removed every year just to keep the population from growing, all right? That's a pretty big number. Now let's think about that in terms of South Carolina. So again, these are the same figures that I showed you earlier from DNR from their survey work to show you um, the harvest levels and the population level estimates for South Carolina, all right? So what actually limits that population in our state from growing? We got predation, we got diseases, we have resource availability, we have hunting pressure, and a big one that we don't discuss often, weather. Predation, you know, what, what actually is taking pigs in South Carolina? Alligators obviously take pigs. Um, I would not put it past a coyote to take a piglet if he had the opportunity. Um, I don't foresee them making that happen in the presence of sows, uh, but it could happen. Owls definitely take them, um, you know, when they're small enough for them to grab. Um, and that's basically it. You know, Bobcat, I'm sure, would take one if he got the opportunity. So predation is pretty low in South Carolina. Diseases and parasites, you know, in, in domestic herds, yeah, they have a pretty big impact on survival. 
it's not really what we see in the wild. You know, those diseases and parasites are out there and they're prevalent, but they don't seem to be limiting those populations. Resources, uh, definitely throughout the range. When resources become limited, populations suffer. You know, if we have a horrible mass crop, that population is gonna suffer from that. If we go through an extreme drought and there's not vegetation to eat, that population will suffer from that. Uh, hunting, hunting's a big one. Um, and, and I don't think we're giving this full credit here in South Carolina. And I think, you know, I ran this by TJ just to make sure I'm not insane with my thought process, but according to DNR survey work, deer hunters are taking, you know, what, 20 plus percent of that population out every year just by deer hunting. We don't know how many pigs are being taken out from night shooting activities. Uh, we don't know how many that the hog doggers are taking out. We don't know how many are being trapped every year. But if you look at this population, it would not be far-fetched to believe that with all of these hunting techniques combined, that we're actually harvesting the pigs that we need to harvest to keep the population stable. Not to reduce it, but to keep it somewhat stable, all right? But I'm not gonna tell you that's exactly what's happening. That is just something to consider because we don't know those numbers. The other thing we have to consider along with that is the population is, is limited by the combination of all these factors, not necessarily just one. So if we're harvesting, uh, you know, 40 plus percent and these other factors are taking out an additional 20 percent, well, there's our 60 percent we should see that population somewhat stabilized. That's possible. And if you look at these figures, uh, starting in, you know, 2015, you start noticing that population just plummeted from 15 to 16. Well, if you were around South Carolina in 2015, you remember the flood that occurred and, you know, the Congaree herd got major, major losses to the Congaree herd. You had big losses in the PD, uh, some parts of the Savannah Valley, uh, but that flood was devastating to that population. The closest one to me is Congaree, and it, it put a hurt on the pigs in Congaree. Was it permanent? Absolutely not, and that's not ever going to be the case. There are going to be some individuals that survive and go back to that worst case scenario. It doesn't take them long to repopulate. That's why annual work is needed, um, but look at what has happened with the weather in this state since 2015. You had uh, the flood and hurricane in 2015. You had Tropical Storm Bonnie in 2016, uh, Tropical Storm Colin in 2016, Tropical Storm Hermine in 2016. We had Hurricane Matthew. Uh, then in 17, we had Hurricane Irma. 19, we had Dorian. Um, it's been on and on and on uh, with wet year, wet year, wet year since 2015. And this definitely helps us with those hog numbers. You know, I, I tell people this all the time. One of the biggest reasons why I think eradication in South Carolina is far-fetched is because there are abundant populations in North Carolina. There are abundant populations in Georgia. There's not a mountain range in South Carolina that a pig can't come across. There's not a river in South Carolina that a pig can't come across. There's not a lake in South Carolina that a pig can't cross. So even if we did everything we could do, they're still gonna come back in from these surrounding states. So we're, we're, we're really, as much as I'm sick of rain right now, we really need to be thinking all this rain because these flooding activities are helping us. Yes, pigs are capable swimmers. They're really good swimmers, but they have to have somewhere to rest and get out of current. If you were at the PD the last time it got out of the banks, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're going to go a long way before that current puts you somewhere that you can get on dry ground. Um, that's just the nature of the game. Uh, so I think if we combine all these factors together, while it might not give us a definite answer of what's going on with this mean population, it does make sense that between all of these factors, including all the different types of hunting and including the weather, we may be harvesting a sufficient amount of pigs at this exact point to keep that population from exploding 
uh, we're, we're keeping it stable. It's, it's slowing the growth. So a lot of you are aware <laughs> that uh, the 2018 Farm Bill included a, a, a pretty good sum of money, $75 million for federal swine eradication efforts across the US. Um, and the first round of that was funded at $16.7 million. And out of that $16.7 million, they're doing 20 total projects in 10 different states. South Carolina is one of those states. Uh, so through the USDA, um, APHIS Wildlife Service Division, uh, they have a pilot project going uh, looking at eradication of pigs in a couple counties. The, the beginning of the project, they had uh, two South Carolina counties, Hampton County and Newberry County. I've had a lot of questions about why those two counties. Well, from a pilot project perspective, you have Hampton County, which has an extremely high population of feral hogs, but it also has a very old, well-established population of feral hogs. Newberry County, on the other end, is the exact opposite. It's a relatively new population of hogs. They're fairly confined to a few areas. They're not spread throughout the entire county. So the idea was to look and see if eradication efforts could work in either one of those scenarios and how they played out in each one of those scenarios. Uh, beginning the second year, which would be this year, uh, Jasper County was added uh, to that project. So now we're, we're, we're looking at those programs in three total counties. Um, that, that Wildlife Services is working with. And um, Noel Myers, who heads it up, I asked him to send me this, and, and thank you, Noel, if you're watching for doing that. But um, this is a, a figure that shows where he currently has employees on the ground doing feral hog control work. Uh, so he has 10 uh, or 11, I think it's 11, but they're not all full-time just working pigs. He has 10 or 11 employees who are dedicated uh, to doing pig work across the state. And the red circles uh, are areas where they would like to include new trappers uh, to help manage this program, uh, problem or part of this program uh, moving forward in the future. Uh, so these guys are out there year round and they are, uh, you know, put, putting boots in the mud and getting traps out and doing what they can do to knock these numbers back. So that is going on. Um, how effective is it? Uh, I think it's a good thing to add into our numbers total. You know, everything they're doing just adds to what we're doing. And if everybody's doing their part, then we're beating these hogs back. Uh, but as the figure showed you, at this point, we may be holding them at bay, but we are not eradicating them. Uh, it, it's gonna take a lot more intensive work there. Uh, and, and again, I think at this point, it's still a little far-fetched to think we can eradicate them, but I don't wanna say it's impossible. 